Pop quiz, nerds. What was the first ever geometry textbook? Three, two, one. Got your answer? If you said the elements, you're right. Sometime in the 5th century BC, Hippocrates wrote the first ever systematically organized geometry textbook called The Elements. Wait, you, you were thinking Euclid's Elements? No, no, this didn't come around until the 4th century BC. Oh, I just gotta smell it. <sighs> Oh, wow, that smells so good. Of course, Euclid's elements ended up surviving the test of time, being used and republished from 325 BC all the way until today. On the other hand, Hippocrates' elements is sadly lost to time, but there is a saving grace. This is Eudemus of Rhodes, a pupil of Aristotle, and perhaps the first historian of science. And although Hippocrates' work was lost, one of his proofs was preserved in Eudemus' History of Geometry. But all of Eudemus' work was also lost. No matter, there is still a hero who remains. Simplicius of Cilicia was a pagan philosopher who wrote extensive commentaries on the works of Aristotle and others. This is Cilicia on a map. For perspective, that's the Black Sea, and this is Turkey. Now, as luck would have it, in Simplicius's enormous commentary on Aristotle's physics, which was written around the year 500 in the Common Era and consisted of over half a million words in Greek. In this massive work, Simplicius saw fit to include an incredible proof from Hippocrates' Elements, which was contained in Eudemus's History of Geometry. As David Burton describes it in his History of Mathematics, it is the only sizable fragment of classical Greek mathematics that has been transmitted to us as originally composed. And to understand what makes Hippocrates' proof so special, you need to understand that finding the area of a curved figure is a difficult task. In general, finding the area of a region with a curved boundary is done using calculus. But you may have learned a thing or two about circles. Circles, we know, have an area of pi times the radius squared. And this was known long before the discovery of the calculus. The area of a circle was demonstrated by Archimedes in 250 BC. Given the simplicity of the circle and the incredible talent of Archimedes, nobody would blame you for thinking this was the first time someone had ever found the area of a non-rectilinear shape, but this was not the first such discovery. The proof from Hippocrates, which was included in Eudemus' History of Geometry and then described in Simplicius's commentary of Aristotle's physics, is indeed an area calculation for a curvilinear figure that was done around 400 50 BC. That's 200 years before Archimedes' work on the circle. Hippocrates' great discovery actually came about during his quest to square the circle. This phrase, common in descriptions of Greek mathematics, means to construct a square with straight edge and compass that has area equal to a given circle. And the curved shape that Hippocrates squared 200 years before the circle is called a loon, from the Latin word luna, which of course means moon. A loon is the concave convex region bounded by two circular arcs. Put simply, two circles intersect and two loons are created. Of course, there are many ways that two circles might intersect and they create loons that resemble different phases of the moon. Here, this bigger circle cuts this loon from the smaller circle, and the smaller circle cuts this loon from the bigger circle. Remember, the loon is concave convex. It has an 
outward curve and an inward curve. This region in the middle is simply convex. It is not a loon. So how did Hippocrates find the area of one of these curved regions way back in 450 BC? Well, Hippocrates' argument doesn't begin with just any loon. Instead, he begins with an isosceles right triangle. With this triangle, Hippocrates considered two loons simultaneously. First, he constructed this semicircle that circumscribes the right triangle. Then, on each leg of the isosceles right triangle, he constructed a semicircle. So now we have three semicircles. The semicircle, whose diameter is the hypotenuse of this isosceles right triangle. And then the two semicircles, whose diameters are those congruent legs of the right triangle. Of course, the big semicircle cuts both of the small semicircles, creating these two loons. Now, to continue the argument, let's use the version that I printed with technology. First, we must ask this question. How do the diameters of those smaller semicircles on the legs of the right triangle compare to the diameter of the bigger semicircle that lies on the hypotenuse? Well, in Hippocrates' time, just like ours, the Pythagorean theorem was known. So, if we regard the congruent legs of the right triangle to have lengths of one, then by the Pythagorean theorem, certainly the hypotenuse has a length of square root of two, because one squared plus one squared has to equal c squared. So the hypotenuse c is root two. So now we know how the diameters compare. The ratio of the diameter of the small semicircles to the big semicircle is one to root two. And although the exact area of a circle wasn't yet known, Hippocrates did know this important fact. If you square the ratio of the diameters of two circles, you will get the ratio of their areas. Now, of course, if we square this ratio of diameters, we're going to get one squared over root two squared, which of course is one over two or one half. So Hippocrates knew that for each of these smaller semicircles, its area was one half that of the big semicircle. This means that the two small semicircles circles, which of course are congruent since they lie on equal sides of the right triangle, their two areas combined must equal the area of the larger semicircle, since each of the smaller is exactly one half of the larger. Let's just label some of these regions now to complete the argument. We'll have L1 and L2 for loon 1 and loon 2. Then for these two segments of the big semicircle that are cut by the isosceles right triangle, we'll call them R1 and R2. Now we had just said that adding the areas of the two small semicircles will equal the area of the big semicircle. We can write that out in an equation. The area of the first small semicircle is L1 plus R1, and then add that to the second semicircle, which is L2 plus R2. This must equal the area of the big semicircle, which we see is R1 plus R2 plus the area of the isosceles right triangle. I'll just sketch that isosceles right triangle into the equation here for convenience. Now, hopefully you can see exactly where this is going. From the two smaller semicircles, we can remove the region R1 and the region R2. If we remove the same regions, R1 and R2, from the big semicircle, then the remaining areas must still be equal, namely, the combined areas of the first loon and the second loon must equal the area of that isosceles right triangle. The area of a triangle was also known in Hippocrates' time, so adding these two loons together will produce an area of one-half base times height, the base is 1, the height is 1, so in this case it would just be 1 half. Of course, the two loons are congruent, so each of these loons must make up half of the total area, so we could say, for example, that the first loon and the second loon both have an area of 1 
forth. And I hope you agree, that is such a wonderful proof. Equating the areas of these two semicircles to the big semicircle, and then removing a common region to produce what remains just a triangle that must equal the area of the remaining loons. Hippocrates had a phenomenal mind, but there is a pretty big detail we're missing. In this argument, Hippocrates' aim was to square the loon. But remember what that meant to the Greeks. It would mean to actually construct a square with an area that's equal to the loon. So far, we've only shown that the two loons together have the area of this isosceles right triangle. Or if we wanted to, we could cut the isosceles right triangle in half to get the area of a single loon. Either way, for a Greek master like Hippocrates, we've done enough. He knows how to square a triangle, so this proof shows he can square the loons. But these days, most people aren't so well versed in geometric construction. So allow me to very briefly finish this discussion by actually squaring this triangle and thus squaring the loons. Here's our isosceles right triangle from before, which we know has the area equal to the two loons. We're going to begin by extending the base AB, or what's really the hypotenuse. Next, we're going to drop a perpendicular from C down to that hypotenuse AB. This perpendicular, of course, is the height of the right triangle, with AB viewed as the base. Next, we construct the perpendicular bisector of this altitude of the right triangle. We can now take half of the height on our compass because we've just bisected the altitude, and now we're going to mark half the height away from this point B on the extended segment AB, and we'll call this point we've marked off D. Next, we construct the perpendicular bisector of the line segment AD. Now we can take half of the segment AD on our compass and then construct the semicircle that has AD as its diameter. Then we construct a perpendicular line through the point B. Where this line intersects the semicircle we drew is the first side of our square. We can then take the side length of the square on our compass and mark a few more points to complete the square. And thus, we have squared the triangle in the traditional sense. And as a result, we have squared these two loons. Wow, I am just so tickled by these things. That's awesome. I gotta take a story of this for my Instagram. Oh yeah, that is legit. So that's the story of the first curvilinear figure, as it's called, to be squared. Let me know in the comments if you had any questions, and be sure to subscribe for more of the swankiest math videos on the internet. I'm unstable, I'm feeling hard to keep the cable cut and untuck the table If Texas instruments don't reply, I think this time it might be fatal I Wish to sell my own fake cause I'm traded Hate the odds that I calculated Press and pull and pray and push it all the way through the whole blue planet faded Psychosomatic habits why you're so, so